Okay, class, in this unit, we're gonna get into some measurement properties um, and things that may influence um, hypertension diagnosis and management according to um, how we're actually assessing it. So um, I like this little uh, robot from The Simpsons called Linguo, um, and whenever there was a, an error, he would screen this, or a grammatical error he would perceive, he would always shout this, error, error, so a little, little fun reference there. All right, so. Um, issues of brachial blood pressure, right? So just to remember, brachial blood pressure may not actually reflect central blood pressure, right? We're, we're kind of extending a corollary from whatever we assess in the periphery, because um, we know generally arterial pressure, right, in, in the arm is going to be pretty close to what we see at the aorta, which is, you know, will be a little bit higher, um, um, but this should be roughly the same. So we're making kind of an inference based on what we see in the periphery. Um, a lot of cuffs may underestimate systolic or overestimate diastolic. However, no matter what, it's better than not taking it, right? Like we have no way of knowing. Because right? even if static blood pressure is really just a snapshot, doesn't let us look at, you know, how they do it throughout the day, you know, it, it's, it's better than not knowing because it's not like I can look at someone and tell that they have hypertension. Right? I can't ask him a question. In fact, this has actually been researched. A colleague of mine down in uh, Virginia, uh, Kyle Feldman, and some of his colleagues was published, I think, in Cardiopoem PT Journal in 2017 that actually tested this, it, whether or not you could ascertain whether someone had hypertension from a visual report inspection and a, um, you know, a medical history. And of course, as you guys know, hypertension is asymptomatic um, that, yeah, there was no way they, 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 they weren't able to do that, which shouldn't come as any surprise. Now, we actually think, um, again, because, because static blood pressure is just a snapshot, there may be some additional use looking at during exercise. And we'll get into some of the um, the literature looking at exercise responses because it can help us identify patients who may be um, having mass hypertension, so normal blood pressure um, on a, you know, assessment, but a hypertensive at home. And we'll get into some of these characteristics in a bit. So again, some compounding factors of blood pressure measurement. So one thing I want to clarify, no patient with, like it gets diagnosed as hypertensive from a single blood pressure measure, or at least they should not. The recommendations with the AHA and multiple guidelines follow this typical pattern that you have to have at least three, where's my little mouse, three elevated readings in the clinic. And then either you're often sent home with an ambulatory blood pressure monitor or a home reading. Ambulatory blood pressure monitors measure your blood pressure roughly every 30 minutes, 15 minutes, depending on the device. We use them in our, in our lab here um, to look at blood pressure throughout the day to get a real true reflection of their blood pressure, um, as well as to see do they, you know, do there's blood, does their blood pressure normally dip at night like, like it should, um, or is it say chronically elevated, or are there large fluctuations throughout the day? Or they'll be sent home with a home reading, right? So they'll take it maybe four times a day. And if they, you know, are hypertensive at home after again, you know, three elevated readings, then they're diagnosed with hypertension. Now that's the guidelines. Does it always happen that way? Maybe not, but that's how it's supposed to go. Other things to bear in mind, that there's going to be some difference in blood pressure according to the time of day. Your pressure is typically a little bit higher in the morning and a little bit lower in the evening. There's also that property of mast hypertension, right, that um, again, we talked about there are some individuals that have normal blood pressures in the clinic, but they're elevated at home, which makes it really hard to detect. Um, and again, we think exercising can unmask that. Then, of course, there's white coat syndrome, which everyone, I think, recognizes, uh, where you have an elevated blood pressure in the clinic, um, despite a normal home blood pressure monitor, right? either on the ambulatory or home blood pressure monitor. Technique errors, oscillatory gaps, and these are some of the big ones. And these are things we've covered before. We want to make sure that our patients are seated with their with their back supported, legs uncrossed, feet flat. Don't place a cuff over clothing. And you'd be surprised how often this happens. There was a study that was published, I believe, in 2017, 
2016, I think it might have been in JAMA, that show they, uh, they assessed medical students, first year medical students, and found, I think it was a, a sample of 159 students, only one, only one out of 159, I believe, one out of 159, were able to take blood pressure correctly and avoid all these technical errors, which speaks to, again, there may be some concerns about like, you know, are we even measuring things correctly? Because, you know, again, if we can see if your cuff's over clothing, which I have unfortunately seen a few times in the clinic in, in my days, um, can, can significantly um, artificially raise your blood pressure reading um, because of you know, the properties of the device. So again, um, and first year medical students, unlike physicians, like should know how to do this. And I'd say it's probably pretty accurate to what we see in PT practice too. And maybe our technique is, isn't super great. Um, so again, these are things to consider when we look at the, the data and the literature about hypertension and management that you know, are, we, are we doing, are we using good technique in the clinic? And then just a brief thing to remember um, that you know, there's arguments about automatic cuffs, manual cuffs for blood pressure measurement. They're both equally accurate for measuring baseline blood pressure at rest. They use different techniques, manual measurements, as we know, are based on the identification of sounds, the carotid cuff sounds, which appear after we return blood flow into the artery after occluding it with a cuff. The vessel wall vibrates, produce sounds, and we can hear that. All symmetric devices use those same vibrations, but we're not perceiving sound with an automatic off metric cuff. That device is detecting the vibrations and transducing it into electrical signals to identify the point of maximal oscillation, which is corresponds to your mean pressure. And since mean pressure can follow that very nice calculation, right? We know two times diastolic plus one systolic, we can you know, um, use the mean to calculate systolic and diastolic based on that point um, estimate. So um, they use different properties. They're both equally reliable for measuring resting blood pressure. Um, Automatic devices, less user error, right? Because you don't have to, you don't have to actually set people up and place a scope and hear things. It does it automatically. You got to make sure the patient's positioned correctly. That's still true for anything. But again, you know, the less user error generally. Um, it's not going to be prone that oscillatory gap, which we talked about before, where there's that maybe that period of silence that's prolonged. Um, or if we underinflate, which can happen with a manual measurement, we talked about that radio ablation technique that helps avoid that, but you don't have to worry about that with an automatic cuff. Um, sometimes arrhythmias, right? If you got a really funky arrhythmia, it can throw off an automatic cuff, um, but generally they're pretty good at, at identifying that, that maximal point of, of oscillation. The big limitation to an automatic oscillometric device is that they cannot be used during exercise because they detect blood pressure through vibrations when you walk and when you run, your, your vibration that's translated from your feet and the ground, your reaction forces through your body, that creates vibration that makes these devices completely unreliable. Um, while it's manual measurement, again, a little bit more prone to user error. There is that white coat response potentially because you're gonna be you know, sitting in front of the patient, measuring it. That's kind of why most clinics now, you know, the nurse or medical assistant comes in, places the device on you, cuff on you and leaves. You can't do that with a manual measurement. Um, you could you know, sus be susceptible to the oscillatory gap because, again, you're, you're listening for sounds and sometimes you can underinflate. Um, but the real advantage of manual measurement is that it can be done during exercise. And, and we'll teach you guys that in lab. Um, but yeah, that's the key advantage of manual measurement that you can measure during exercise. And I'd wager if you're going to take an exercising measure, it might be advantageous to, to do a manual measurement so that way you're not switching between our manual measure at rest. So you're not switching between you, the device or the technique you used at rest and as well as you do with exercise. Um, so that ends technique considerations. Again, a little bit of review from like our fundamentals courses. Um, and next we'll get into exercise responses um, in blood pressure.